welcome back to A Drunk History Middle Earth. You notice it's a bit quiet, it's just me today. For Rohan Part 3, you've just got Chris. Now, this is two days before we go on holiday, so things are a bit tight in our house. If Rebecca was a developer, I'd say that she was refactoring our packing, as she's just told me that Packing for three people is very hard. Now, I'd got everything out and I'd packed my own stuff before she told me it was wrong and did it all again. Not good. So we're going to talk about the second line of kings today, of Rohan. We ended last episode with uh, the very sad death of Helm Hammerhand. But before that, if you are just joining us for the first time, uh, firstly, why are you joining a podcast on the third episode of what will be a four-part series on Rohan? Why jump in at this point? But let's just assume you're a, a mentalist who just likes to start in the middle or near the end and, and just roll with it. This is A Drunk History of Middle Earth. My name's Chris. Usually I'm joined by my wife Rebecca and I'm feeling her absence today. It feels I'm feeling a bit sad. And I break down Tolkien concepts and stories in a very easy to understand way as if we were down at the pub talking to each other. There's no frills, there's no fancy prose, it's just pure good fucking stories that we talk about. And this series has been all about Rohan. Previously, oh, oh, the Rohan or the land known, the, the land previously known as, as the Kalinarvon, which was given to the people of the Eothiod by Kyrian, the steward of Gondor, as a reward for helping them at the fields of Celebrant when Gondor faced some very tough enemies. But go back and listen to episode one, if that's what you're on about. So today we're going to talk about the second line of kings. As mentioned, last episode we left off with the death of Helm Hammerhand and the untimely death of his sons, which broke the line of succession, meaning that the next king was actually his nephew, Freylaf Hildeson. So, that's where we're going to start today. Should we get into some good lore? So, Freylaf Hildeson was Helm Hammerhand's sister's son. So it was Helm's nephew. After Helm's untimely death, frozen to death at top of Hel- on top of Helm's day in the great winter that covered Rohan, which prevented Gondor from helping them when the Dunlendings invaded and ultimately, for a bit, won, Freylaf then came to power in a very, very weak Rohan. And this is a name that makes me laugh because Freylaf, his name means surviving lord, which is a very on the nose name for Tolkien, and it's from old English and it seems like it seems like weirdly prophetic. Like as a kid he must have been like you know like mom, why does my name mean surviving lord if uncle Helm is king and he has two sons? That's a bit odd, isn't it? And his mom just kind of laughing going ha ha, don't worry about it son. Anyway, Rohan was weak and it wouldn't be stronger until 40 years or so after Freylaf's death. They'd lost a shit ton of horses to the Dunlendings and cattle as well. And, you know, the, the big winter that killed a lot of people. And also killed a lot of hobbits, which I mentioned on the last episode. And for people who were primarily horse riders and shepherds, this wasn't a good thing to lose. Like, you, you know, if your whole economy is based around horses or cows or, or livestock and you then lose a lot of them, that's not good, is it? It's, uh, it's a bit shit. There's not much else to be said about Freylaf, to be honest. It's just that... His son was famous. His son was was much more well known and, and well loved. So his son his son was called Britta Leofa, and he ruled for forty four years and was a superstar. Everyone bloody loved him, and his name actually reflects this. So Britta means prince or giver or bestower, and Leofa means beloved. So he's like the beloved prince, the beloved gifter, the beloved pr- the bestower, and the the name Britta is from old English poetry, like Beowulf, as a stand-in for princely characters. So princely characters would be called Britta. So in Beowulf, the king Hrothgar is called Beaga Britan, which is giver of rings. And given that this is Viking times, I think this goes back to something I've looked into previously, where in a gift economy, not like a not like just a gift-giving tradition, but a gift economy, an economy based on the giving and receiving of gifts, an arm ring used to be a way to show that your lo- your loyalty, like a, a Jarl or a leader, would give his, like, give his, ser- not his servants, but like his underlings or people who served him, they would be given rings, like arm rings, as a sign of their lord's faith. And it was a very valuable gift. And, and so in return, that meant that they would gift back their loyalty or, or like their support in military matters and what have you. And that's the difference between a gift economy and, and, a, and a highly, like, a, a gift giving culture so that goes back that i've talked about like ancient scandinavia before and obviously it's going to be a bit garbled because surprisingly i'm not as au fait with real world history as i am with fictional history so that's a 
That's always nice to know that I'm that kind of person. Anyway, Britta Leofa was called Beloved Prince because he helped everyone in need. Rohan was suffering under him, so he did what he could. And the people, you know, the people responded to this. They loved him for it. So during his reign, the war between the dwarves and the orcs culminated. And this was the battle of Azanul Bazaar, where the dwarves won outside Moria. Now, if you've seen the Hobbit films, you would have seen a, a, a weirdly, like a little garbled version of this, where it's that big wall, which is where Thorin Orc and Shield gets his name. It's at the battle of Azanul Bazaar. So, and this is where Dane Ironfoot, in the, the real history, he wins much renown because at this battle, Dane Ironfoot beheads the orc Azog the Defiler. Very different from the events of the Hobbit films. But we can cover the, the war between orcs and dwarves in much more detail later, and I'd love to. As well as the war between dwarves and, and dragons. And it's just giving me the idea for a meme, actually. I think I'm going to make it after this. It's uh, do you know that, that from The Simpsons with Groundskeeper Willie, where uh, we don't get along. Like the Scots and the English, or the Scots and the Irish, or Scots and other Scots. And Principal Skinner's like, you Scots are a very contentious people. He goes, you've just made yourself an enemy for life. The result of this battle of Azanul Bazaar is that the orcs were defeated, Mori was abandoned, and half the dark dwarf army was dead or injured. But they still won. Now, because of this, there was like a mass exodus of orcs coming from the Misty Mountains. And naturally, a big way to flee would be those massive open green fields to the south, because across them was the White Mountains. So you remember the way that Rohan's laid out is you've got the southern end of the Misty Mountain, you've got the, the, the big dingling of the Misty Mountains dripping across the Kalanathorn, and then just across Rohan is the White Mountains. Now, if orcs love living in mountains, then the White Mountains are going to be a very good place to live. The orcs flooded, well, not quite flooded, but there was a lot of orcs in Rohan trying to get to the White Mountains, and orcs being orcs would were starting shit the whole time. So, Britta spent most of his rule overseeing orcs being hunted down in Rohan. And by the time of his death, it was quite successful. And, and it was thought that there were no more orcs left alive in Rohan. So, I mean, that's a pretty cool achievement to die thinking that you'd committed a, a successful genocide. I can imagine or the world leaders of today can only dream of an achievement like that. So Britta was actually the longest serving king of the second line because he ruled for 44 years. He was succeeded by his son, so we'll move on now, and his uh, Britta's son was called Walder, which just means ruler in Old English, and it's derived from Wielda, and he ruled for nine years before, uh, surprise, surprise, the orcs weren't dead because they fucking killed him and his men as they rode the mountain paths from Dunharrow. And remember, Dunharrow is the large flat land on top of a very, very hard-to-climb cliff, with a very narrow road that's very easy to defend. And the Rohirrim have fled there and, you know, survived in the past when they've needed to. So yeah, um, this was the this was probably the worst way to find out that all the orcs weren't gone because they killed the king. And that's... Um, in, in So in Tolkien research circles, very highbrow. Um, that's what we call a big fucky-wookie. So it's a very technical term. Walt, so moving on, uh, again, no time to, to fuck about with these kings. Walder was succeeded by his son, Falker, who did indeed clear Rohan of all the orcs. And Falker means folk or people. He's just a simple lad he likes to kill. One thing, one cool thing about Walder is that there's some confusion about his death date, which I thought was interesting. In the published versions of Lord of the Rings, right? In Appendix A, you've got Walder's death date listed as 2851 of the Third Age. But then in Appendix B, that lists all the important dates in the Third Age, his death is 2861 of the Third Age. So there's 10 years difference. But personally, I'm going to err, I'm going to err on the side of 2851. But I think it's a rare mistake from Tolkien. Um, and, and I think it's 2851 because he's mentioned as ruling for only nine years and it wouldn't quite work out if he'd ruled for 19 years instead. So, apart from Falker, so we'll talk, we'll talk, Walder's son, we'll talk about Falker. Apart from the bit, you, you know, about his name being quite simple, and he was the one who cleared Rohan of all the orcs, he was the 13th king, and he ruled for 13 years, which is a bit of odd numerology, and he was a great hunter, but he swore that he would hunt no beast until all the orcs were removed from Rohan. And when this was achieved, he set himself a challenge. So, Falker destroyed the last orc like camp slash stronghold in Rohan, and he set himself a challenge of hunting a legendary boar, and this was a boar called the Great Boar of Everholt in the wood of Firienholt. 
and Falker and the boar killed each other and so ended the 13th king of Rohan. But I want to talk a little bit about the woods and the mountains now, right? So Firienholt means mountain wood and it's got an older Sindarin name of Erin Fuya, which means northward. But then when you take into account that Gondor no longer controlled Rohan, the name Northwood didn't make any sense because it's now South Rohan and North Gondor, so it's a little bit obsolete. But this is one of those places in Middle-earth where there's a little bit of unusualness about it because there was an unnatural silence that lay upon this wood. And it was possibly, possibly because of a seal door hallowing the mountain that it that it rested on. That So these woods climbed up the slopes of a mountain as well, which is Amon Anwar, which is where Elendil was buried. And that's why a seal door had hallowed it. So you have the mountain, then you have the woods at the base of the mountain. And sometimes, because of this dark, this stillness and this quietness around this wood, it was called the Whispering Wood, which is pretty cool. It, you know, I imagine in the summer, that would be beautiful. In the winter, it would probably be a bit terrifying. So the Firian Hull, as I mentioned, this was a forest of oak trees that stood below and on the slopes of the mountain Halifirian, also known as Amon Anwar, and this was the border of Gondor and Rohan. And it was previously, we've talked about this hill in a little bit of detail, a uh, hill, mountain, sorry, it's a mountain. This is the place where Aeol the Young and Kyrian the Steward met and swore an oath of friendship, and, and this is where Kyrian showed Aeol the, the tomb of Elendil. And when I, you know, I mentioned it in the first episode, I said like, oh, it's the, it's a hill, and I kind of left it at that because it wasn't like quite needed for the story. But now is a good time to talk a little bit more about the mountain itself because it, Falker, you know, was in this woods. So Amon Anwar, also known as the Ailenea, and also known as Hal Ifirian, is a holy mountain that stands on the border of Rohan and Gondor. I've mentioned, and this is the highest mountain of the seven beacons of Gondor. So you've got the beacons of Gondor that, you know, like Rohan, uh, Gondor calls for aid and Rohan will answer, blah, blah, blah. This is the highest mountain where the beacons sit on. So it's, fr- you know, you can imagine how big it is. And it was hallowed when Isildur travelled there after the War of the Last Alliance. And he went there with his nephew, Meneldil. And what they did was they manually, like, they levelled the top of the mountain. Like, they just fucking scraped that shit clean, right? So they levelled the top of the mountain. They put in some stairs and they raised a burial mound for Elendil. And this is and this the, the first oath of Sworn here because it was like a holy place, right? It was hallowed. And this is the place that Aragorn and Eomer would then renew the oath after the War of the Ring. So it's a, it's a very important place for Gondor and Rohan just in general. Like it's, it's it, Yeah, so then that's the mountain. And then in the woods around the base of the mountain, there's a part where the boar is famous. So even the even the woods have got different parts to them. And in the Firien Holt, which is the, the woods, there's a place called Everholt, which means boar wood. And by boar, I mean like the, the tusked pigs. I just hope that nobody thinks it's like a really boring bastard walking around just like, oh, I've got some taxes to do. Oh, I've got some... Uh, does anybody want to look at my book of carpet samples? And weirdly enough, right? Apparently the word ever, E-V-E-R, is derived from the word eofa in Old English, meaning boar, which I assume there's something to do with pronunciation there because I just couldn't, ever is a word we use like every day in the English language. So I'd, I'd never thought of any connection with the word boar. But anyway, I did, I originally wrote that I hope that this, unless I cover... Mount Doom or Carathras or Erebor, that that's the most detail I ever go into about a mountain. But I, I realised as I was writing it, all the mountains I didn't talk about and I, I realised it was a it was a bit of a lie. <sighs> anyway, right. Falker died in the Everhold at the hands of the boar. Him and the boar finished each other off. He stabbed it with a spear, it stabbed him with a tusk. After Falker comes the 14th King of Rohan and this is Falkwine. And his name means friend of the people. And he ruled for 39 years. Now we're getting closer to the War of the Ring now because Falkwine is the great-grandfather of Theoden. And he is noted 
as getting help. He got in people to help with the fucking done lendings. So he brought in Gondor to help. And they he got them out of the the area between the River Eisen and the River Adorn because they'd started causing trouble in the west side of Rohan. He in turn sent soldiers to help Gondor when they were having trouble with the Haradrim. However, Falkwine lost his two oldest sons. These were the twins, Falkred and Fastred, and they were killed in battle. And this is an interesting battle that we're going to talk about now. And for anyone who's interacted with me recently, I, I always start talking about just how rabbit holy that it, it starts to go. The closer you get to the War of the Ring, especially in the Third Age, the, the more complex and dense everything gets. Because now we're going to take a sidestep and we're going to talk about a couple of uh, a, a couple of important events in Gondor that people in Rohan played. So, Falkwine sent soldiers to help Gondor after Goldendor helped him with the Dunlendings. And he sent his two oldest sons, the twins, Falkred and Fastred. But they were killed in battle. And so, this meant that Falkwine's younger son, Fengal, would take the throne. But first, let's talk about the battle that the twins died in. And this was called the Battle of the Crossing of the Poros. And this was under the rule of the 23rd steward of Gondor, which was Turin II. The brothers fell fighting side by side, fighting the Haradrim who had invaded Ithilien. And for anyone wondering what Ithilien is, it's um, it's in the films, in the extended versions, I think, Sam and Frodo and Gollum pass through Ithilien and it's where um, the statue with its head cut off, is that's been defaced by the orcs, is starting to grow flowers around its crown again. And Sam's like, oh, look, Mr. Frodo, the king's got his crown again. And it's just a really beautiful, it's, like, it's known as like the gardens. It's like a really beautiful part of Gondor. And unfortunately, by the time of the War of the Ring, it, it, you know, it's, uh, it's really fucked up. But another interesting fact is that the caves, the hidden caves, that Faramir and his rangers use uh, during the War of the Ring. You know when they're watching Gollum in the the water, uh, the the in, like the uh, the Forbidden Pool. That those caves were built for these battles that that you know the crossing of the Poros, because there was tensions between the Haradrim. Because around this time, when Falkwine sent his sons to battle, Sauron was growing strong again. And because we're only a couple of hundred years away from the War of the Ring at this point, right? So he was stirring up shit with the Haradrim, and he got them to invade Gondor as part of his plans to like weaken his enemy. So the two twins fought in this battle and they fell, and they were buried not far from the river, uh, the River Poros, and they were in a burial mound called the Halthinguanu, which most likely means burial mound of the twins in Sindarin. But it said, and, and this is a, one of those little odd, spooky things, it said that for ages afterwards that the enemies of Gondor were terrified to come near, or they were too terrified to pass the burial mounds, or come close to the burial mounds. Which is, is really cool, that like two princes of Rohan fought so well and died so well that their graves scared orcs and like trolls and shit. But also, please uh, say a prayer for me when I eventually cover the history of Gondor because it's going to be fucking mental. But anyway, right, let's have a look at the uh, the, the youngest son, Fengal. So he takes over from Falkwine, and uh, I, I assume he wasn't expecting to rule because his two older brothers, you know, died at the same time. Oh, dear. So Fengal ruled for 50 years. Now, I just want to make a slight adjustment. Earlier, I said Brito was the longest ruling king. I fucked that up. He did rule for 44 years, but he was the longest lived king. So he was like, he was 90 when he died. And he, he was the longest lived king. He wasn't the longest ruling king. So if you're stuck with us over the last 10 minutes, then sound. So let's talk about Fengal. He's a bit of a dick, to be honest. He came, at the age, he came at the throne at the age of 33, and because he was the youngest son, he was spoiled, essentially. He was a spoiled dick. And he's apparently his name appears in Beowulf three times, and it means prince. But I'll, I'll quote from Tolkien on this one. Fengal, he was the third son and fourth child of, child of Falkwine. He is not remembered with praise. He was greedy of food and of gold. 
and at strife with his marshals and with his children. Thengel, his third child and only son, left Rohan when he came to manhood and lived long in Gondor and won honour in the service of Turgon. So Thengel, with an F, F, Thengel, was such a dickhead that his son left Rohan entirely and went to live in fucking Gondor and married his wife and lived there with her. And it's only in the year 2953 of the Third Age when Thengel died that his son, Thengel, with a T-H, reluctantly returned to Rohan to rule. And I've got to say, this is fucking exhausting that with my accent, having to separate the Fs and the Ths, is, it's not an issue when I'm talking, but it's making sure that's pronounced enough that you can hear the difference. So, in perhaps the most confusingly named king and son duo, Thengel, with a Th, took the throne after coming home. And his Thengel's name means Lord in Old English. So, Thengel with a Th has fucked off and died because he was a fucking wanker. All with an F. And thankfully, Thengel came th- Thorm. Anyway, right. So, Thengel means Lord in Old English and is related to the word Thane, which is also the senior political figure in the Shire. And that again, just, it, it, it draws right back into Tolkien's way, I think, of drawn right back into the histories of when the, when the, the Rohirrim were the Aeotheod in the far north where they would have interacted with the, the hobbits or the, you know, the, the, the proto hobbits or, you know, the people who would eventually become the hobbits. And, and they've got these like little, little cool interactions in both their language that shows like just how close these people must have once been. Once been. Also, Thengel in the old English word is spelt with the letter Thorn, which is the one, the letter I talked about in the episode when we had Alex on, who, uh, when we were talking about Feanor. So the letter Thorn is an old English, or it's an old rune, which is like a straight line. It's like a P if you move the curve of the P like halfway down the line. And I fucking love that letter. Any chance I get to talk about Thorn, I will. So anyway, Thengel ruled for 27 years and died at the age of 75. And this is getting really close to Lord of the Rings now. So we're going to start now to see characters we recognize. Thengel was very famous. And very well respected in, in Gondor for the things he did in the service of the steward, Turgon. And Turgon the second was the 24th steward, as I've mentioned. Unusually for Tolkien, we know quite a lot about Thengel's wife, which we're going to talk about now. And we even, fucking hell, we have some information about one of the daughters. Perhaps for the first fucking time in all of these kings. So let's talk about them first, right? His wife was called Morwen Steelsheen. And she was from Los Arnok in the south of Gondor, which is a place that is renowned for being beautiful. Like, it's, it's got beautiful flowers and beautiful trees. And interestingly for Tolkien, he wrote here of perhaps the Gondorians mixing up or mistranslating the names from Sindarin and getting things wrong. So, the name Los Arnok means flowery Arnok. And it's like a mad mix of Sindarin and pre-Numenorian human language. So, Los bear with me for this one it's a bit weird loss means snow in sindarin l-o-s-s means snow but the word loth l-o-t-h in sindarin means flowers so there's there's two possibilities here it's called loss anok l-o-s-s because the flowers and trees have snowy blooms and there's a lot of white trees or there's a big confusion of language, and the L-O-S-S and L-O-T-H got mixed up. So they, they meant to say flowers and instead said snow. So if I was in Germany and I said Mitkart, and they handed me a shopping trolley, it might, you know, I, I would be very confused. But anyway, odd little etymology of lost words and translation confusions, which I think is pretty cool. But Los Arnok, Tolkien explicitly said, was based on the Italian town of Assisi, which I think has got something to do with, like... I think it's got something to do with, like, a Pope or something. I know there's, like, like St. Francis of Assisi or some shit like that in Christianity, but I think he was just talking about the town. Because looking at pictures of it, it's fucking beautiful. I'd love to visit there one day. Anyway... Regardless of the etymology, 
uh, Los Arnok was used during the War of the Ring as a place where refugees went for safety. So it sits on the south side of the White Mountains. And it, by all accounts, per- bloody beautiful place. But going back to Thengel and Morwen, they married when she was 21 and he was 38, which is a bit of a fucking age gap there. Like uh, They had three kids in Gondor, then two more in Rohan, making uh, five total. I don't know why I wrote that down. I'm pretty sure everyone listening to this can add fucking three and two. The only ones we know about, though, are Theoden, the second oldest, and then Theodwin, the youngest, who is the mother of Eomer and Eowyn. So Morwen has a pretty noble lineage of her own. She is a princess of the house of Dol Amroth. Or, or she's, oh, sorry, or her family are related to the princes of Dol Amroth. And prince, in this sense, is an honorific title given to the male heirs of the house of Dol Amroth and dates way back to the founding of Gondor. And I think it was Elendil who first gave out the title of Prince of Dol Amroth. And that's where it comes from. It's an honorific title. It doesn't mean like you're like the heir to the throne of Gondor. It's more the fact that you are the highest that you can be for your family's house because it's the noble houses. So what we see from this, though, is that Morwen and Thengel's kids, so Theoden and Theodwin and, and the other three, they are nobles of both Gondor and Rohan which is a fucking fantastic lineage. But then Aomer, her grandson, who we'll cover more next episode, he goes on to mansa, uh, marry Princess Lothiriel of the House of Dol Amroth, the daughter of Prince Imrahil, who uh, a people will have to cover because like we're, we're deep into it here. But suffice it to say for now that Prince Imrahil of Dol Amroth plays a big part in the books, uh, in, the, like, in the fights in Gondor, and he even rules... Gondor for a little bit while Aragorn's busy at the Black Gate, but unusually for a, a fiction book, there's no strife when Aragorn comes back. He's like, "Yep, done my job. Here you go, mate. There's your there's your kingdom. Peace out." So we'll talk about Morwen. Her name translates to Dark Maiden. Uh, Mor M O R means black, and Wen W E N means maiden. So uh, Mor meaning is black, darkness, dark and Maiden, so based on like her dark hair and what have you. There's also another Morwen in the stories, and that is in the first age. It's Turin Turambar's mother is called Morwen, I think. Oh, just off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure she is. And I always imagine her as uh, being played by Timothy Chalamet because he looks like he could play a woman called Morwen. The Steel Sheen part of Morwen. Steel Sheen is more of a descriptive, like honorific, and that was given to her by the Rohirrim. And this was like a description of her grace and pride that she had in her bearing. Like she was she was hard and beautiful. Like she looked like if you fuck around, you're gonna find out with this woman. And her pride came through in her bearing, and her kids and grandkids inherited these traits, some of these traits as well, right? They were taller and generally more regal than the other Rohirrim, because as she descended from the house of Dol Amroth. She had the Dúnedain of the South blood in her, so the blood of Númenor was still running in their veins. And it so Theoden has the blood of the Dúnedain, Eomer, Eowyn, Theodwin. You know, like her kids and grandkids, like they they have got a good fucking lineage, which was something I wasn't expecting when I started researching this. Is that I thought they were all Rohan born and bred, but then it turns out no, they've actually got like a, a good fucking lineage of. All like the the nobles, like they've got Numenorean blood in a sense, which is pretty cool. Tolkien said that in particular, Eowyn was noticeably taller and more graceful than other women of Rohan because of a mixed heritage. It's a bit of shade, it's not nice. But Morwen and Thengel were married for 10 years in Gondor before he returned to Rohan with Morwen in order to take the kingship in the year 2953. So they were married in the year 2943 of the Third Age. But Things weren't all that well, because during Thengel's reign, Sauron took control of Isengard for himself, and this is where he becomes a, an active like pro- antagonist of Rohan. He starts to fortify Isengard, and he begins to give trouble to Rohan. He encroaches on their borders, like he, he sends people over the borders to just do whatever he wants, and he starts uh, supporting their enemies, like the Dunlendings. And, and then we also see like more of... Um, like horses being stolen and what have you twat 
Anyway, Thengel was known as a good and wise king. The speech of Gondor was used in his house, as opposed to Rohanese, which had been used by every king previously. But the speech of Gondor was Sindarin, and they also used the common tongue of Westron. Rohanese wasn't... I imagine it would have been a known language, but it wasn't an official language in his house. Like, at court and stuff like that, you didn't speak Rohanese, you'd either speak Westron or Sindarin. Overall, like, the people loved it, like, he was a loved king, but this wasn't one of his most popular choices. Like, there was a fair few people who disagreed with this. Coming on to his daughter, Theodwin, she was born last, like, as I mentioned, she was the youngest of his kids, and this was ten years after the return to Rohan. And by this point, though, it's said that her brother Theoden loved her dearly. So when Theodwin was born, Theoden was already 15. And so he was like, oh, I've got a lovely baby sister. Oh my God, she's beautiful. And the last notable event that I want to cover from Thengel's rule, before we wrap it up for today, is uh, a fella who came into Thengel's service. So around the year 2957... A northern wanderer called Therongil came into the service of Thengel, and he served under Thengel for a time before he departed to Gondor to serve under the steward at the time, because uh, the steward Ecthelion put out a call that the enemies of Gondor were gathering, and any who had strength and courage could come and find, you know, good work. And everyone loved Therongil. He was very much loved. He was a leader. He was an amazing leader of men. He was competent. He'd usually get done what needed to be done. And later we'd come to know Thorongil as Aragorn. But in his early days, this is when he's disguised and he's not quite ready to become king of Gondor. Now, this is a, a fairly happy end because I couldn't find any notes on Thengel's death. So, I'm going to wrap this episode up by assuming that Thengel died peacefully at the age of 75, which sets the stage for his son Theoden to become the 17th king of Rohan, which is where we'll pick up with part four on our series on Rohan. And the reason I'm ending it here is because covering Theoden's life, then Aeomer's life, then Elfwine's rule is going to be chunky because there's so much wrapped in up into it all and it's a it's a it's a biggie but i hope you've learned something today from the second line of kings and we're we're gonna cheat slightly because this isn't the full second line because obviously we've still got theoden to go and the third line doesn't start until theoden dies but i hope you've enjoyed this whistle stop tour through the 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 kings of rohan and by the time you hear this uh we should be back for our holidays so i'm hoping we've had a good time and the fucking ship doesn't sink because we're going on a cruise but yeah that's it that's uh that's good i've had so much fun researching this series so far i'm very scared when i do gondor but i've also got some events with the dwarves i want to cover first so as always If you want to come and uh, support the show, I've got a link in my bio where you can donate to the charity that I'm fundraising for as I'm running a half marathon in September, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, 13.1 miles. And if you follow us on Instagram as well, I'm also uploading uh, short videos every time I go for a run. I call it Tubby Training Talking Talks where I just drop a little bit of law after every run. And, um, you know, it's it's a nice way to just keep engaged and show people that I am putting the work in to, you know, to, to do this half marathon. But thank you for stopping by. Thank you for listening. Come and give me a shout if you've got any feedback, anything you want to see on the podcast, anything you want to know more about, any questions you want to have, anything I've said today that's been wrong or you think, uh, you know, you think it's wrong or you think I haven't interpreted something right, come and, come and chat to me. But other than that, I'm... And you know what? I'm going to say goodbye. So have a good day wherever you are. Put your pants back on from listening to this episode. I know people like to get a bit too comfortable when listening to us. Catch you later. Bye.